Let me know when you're ready. Alex, are you ready? Turn it so that all of, uh, they can see everybody. And let's say hello, Tammy. hands, in the master's hands tonight. When someone, something, or anything is placed in the hands of Jesus, there is an unlimited potential for great blessing and multiplication to happen. But that multiplication and great blessing brings about the need for humility, <coughs> obedience, and the breaking of a life if it is to be used. How many want your lives to be used for the kingdom of God? Amen. 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 We many times need to be broken. Amen. We need to be built back up in the kingdom of God. Amen. The apostle Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward those things which are ahead. The Apostle Paul was talking about three advanced doctoral degree equivalents that he would have had. The fact that he was a, uh, a Pharisee. Uh, the fact that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. The fact that he was nearly perfect in the law. The fact that he was the greatest of the great in, involved in, in, in that uh, class of Jews. And all of this, he says, is but dumb. If God's really going to move and do something in our life. See, the problem we have, the issue we have, is we often try to bring too much of us into the kingdom of God with us. Like somehow we have something to bring to the table. Like we're going to take all of our junk, all of our things that we think are cool, all of us that we think makes us us, this is just my thing. And we're going to throw it on the table before the Lord and say, what are you going to do with this? I can't wait. I'll bet you're lucky you got me today. And so we bring this, we lay it on the table like God needs something from our old lives to be successful in eternity. Mm -hmm. Matthew 14, 15 through 21, a very popular portion of scripture of, uh, of scripture, of course. Verse 15, now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not to go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and take the five loaves and the two fish. And he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves. And he gave them to the disciples. And the, dis the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and they were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men. Not including the women and children. Some say there was upwards of ten to 12,000 people that were fed with five loaves and two fish. See, Jesus, at the Last Supper, he used bread to symbolize his body and that his body would be broken and given for all mankind. I look at this, we just read, and it almost gives me a picture of that, that he said, no, we're not going to send them away. They've been hearing the word of God all day. They've been in ministry, they've been filled uh, with, 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 with my spirit. They've been hearing and learning from me. No, we're not going to send them away. In fact, I'm going to feed them by the power of God. And he sits them down, and he breaks the bread. We have a picture that his life was broken for all mankind. And that was perhaps further revelation and how an earlier miracle, the loaves and fishes, is to be understood. These loaves can in turn symbolize our lives, you and I, 
being placed in the master's hands. I want you to hear something. I, I, I've, I've preached on this, uh, on this topic, of course, many times through the years, but I want you to hear this. These loaves symbolize our lives being placed in the master's hands. How do we gain blessing in this world? Some would say, well, hard work. Working by the sweat of our brows, you read from the curse in Genesis chapter 3. Still, after all our hard work, the vagaries of life can steal it away. The federal government raising taxes or lowering benefits. Wages are going down. Hours are being cut. Jobs are hard to find. Obamacare raising to ridiculous levels. Raising the age to receive Social Security. You paid into this your whole life. You're finally about to become 65. And they raise the age to 72. They haven't done that, but they're thinking about it. And people are up in arms. Protesting everything from raising the minimum wage to transgender bathrooms. Everything is an issue in this generation. Makes you wonder what you're working to build. Will there be a recognizable America for your kids as they're growing up? Or your, if you're in my uh, case, your grandchildren. See, placing our lives into the hands of Jesus, into the hands of the Master, causes a redemptive elevation. It lifts us immediately. When we place our, our lives, when we place us, when we place our attitudes, our dreams, our, our hopes, our fears into the hands of Jesus, our lives automatically, redemptively, and resurrection elevation, a transcendency comes in and immediately something supernatural can take place. He blesses Everything he touches. Yes. You see, he moves us into a realm of the transcendent. Transcendent simply means it's something that is beyond the natural. A transcendency is transcending us, lifting us up above what is naturally capable of able or possible. Yeah. See, we are blessed by association. He blesses everything he touches. He turns the natural instantly into the supernatural. Our tithes, our offerings, our finances, our health, our bodies, my preaching, our words spoken in his spirit become rhema. They become alive. Those words leave my mouth and something supernatural happens. It's no longer words. It's now the power of his spirit to speak life into the hearts of men and women. That's a powerful thing that happens when we put that into the Master's hands. When we let Him touch that area of our lives. Jesus looked up to heaven to bless what He was given. See, blessing comes from God. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of Light with whom there is no variation or shadow uh, of turning. Uh, that also translates, that means there's no regrets. It's not unintentional. He's not going to take that back. He doesn't regret doing that. There's no shadow of turning. There's no change in his mind. There's no changing of circumstances that's going to cause this not to work. All mankind experiences some level of blessing. Matthew 5, verse 45, the Bible says, So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. See, sun and rain give life. It's part of God's natural order. God has placed in order with the universe the blessing of rain and sunshine and the needs that bring life and that help sustain life. And he's saying, I've put it out there. I've made the laws of gravity affect everyone. Amen. Not just my chosen few, not just mine whom I've blessed, but I have allowed the goodness of my creation to bless every single soul, whether saved or unsaved. Amen. He warmth 
sustains growth, energy, solar, hydraulic, all of this takes place because God has put it in place in natural law and it blesses everybody. Jesus blesses believers even more. Remember, he says in Matthew 15 that the, the children's bread is for the children. Matthew 15, miracle provision, eternal life, jobs, healing, answered prayer, amen, comfort of soul, and sanity of mind. These are things that Jesus gives to his children. These are things that born again people get. This is an umbrella blessing of God. That God has brought a transcendency to our lives that gives us an edge up, that gives us a leg up in this world, that we are knocked down by the economies that are crashing. But we're in God's economy. And so God has raised us up. And God has placed us in a special place. And God is taking care of us. And God is moving powerfully by His Spirit. Come on, somebody. John 10, 10. I came that they may have life. And not just have life, but have it more abundantly. So first of all, He blessed what was in His hand. Secondly, he broke what was in his hands. There's a recent story of an American man ejected from a flight because of racist rants about the Pakistani man he was sitting between. Apparently, the Pakistanis kept talking across him throughout the entire flight. And he let loose on the airline staff for sitting him in the middle of them. His conduct got so bad that he was removed from the plane at Auckland, New Zealand and charged with racial harassment. There are better ways to handle that situation, how many can say amen, than to become completely unruly and get kicked off a plane. Uh, hey, I think you've lost control of something if that's what ends up having to happen. See, Americans are known throughout the world for being brash, for being demanding, even arrogant. Loud Americans, angry Americans, always right Americans. These are famous slogans throughout the world of travel. Of course, uh, I was called the red-faced American in, in when I went to Greece. And they would look at me, especially when I'd start preaching, and they, they, would, they would kind of chuckle, and they started, they, they, in, in Greek, that was eventually translated to English for me to understand was, you are the red-faced American. She's part of our DNA. We grow up in a culture that teaches us that we can be anything we want to be, even President of the United States. How many can say amen? Yes. I'm not running, don't worry. This has also developed a stigma that we're a proud people. Admittedly, we say, we can say, or we can admit that we suffer from pride from time to time. Is anybody with me, or is it just me? Pride can be inherent. Pride can be a killer. Pride can keep us from doing the only thing we need to do to get right. That's a powerful thought. See, God needs to break that. God needs to bring humility into our lives, but He cannot bring humility into our lives. He cannot break that pride until first we allow Him to have our lives. You see, until we are placed into the Master's hands, He cannot break us. I said, until you can be placed in the master's hands, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you cannot be broken. See, that's why some people don't get set free. That's why some people come, they say a prayer at the altar, they leave, they never come back. They never got right, they, they never stopped sinning, they went back and, and, and did drugs almost immediately. Uh, some, you know, come in, I want to be fit, set free, I'm an alcoholic, and, and they go and they immediately drink that very night. After powerful churches, why? Because they never truly placed their lives in the hands of Jesus and not break them. He did not have control over our lives, our decisions, because we would not let him break us. In reality, I mean, let's look at let's look at the truth. In reality, the light, <laughs> in light of who Jesus is, we are nothing. It's amazing to me how we think we know so much that you'll come in off the street. You'll be here 24 minutes. That's funny, not 25, not 23, 24 minutes. You'll be in here 24 minutes. 
and you're already arguing with God because you don't like the preaching. Oh. You don't like what's being said. Yeah. You don't like, and so now all of a sudden you don't like anything. You don't like the praise. You don't like the worship. You don't like sissy so and so that's staring at you. <laughs> you don't like nothing. In fact, these people are fanatics and I just want to get out of here. So you're arguing with God 24 minutes in. You're arguing with God on how you know better for what's better for your life than he does. And you're just going to leave and forget this whole thing. I'm just going to go do my thing. It was July of 1961, and the 38 members of the Green Bay Packers football team were gathered together for the first day of training camp. The previous season had ended with a heartbreaking defeat when the Packers squandered a lead late in the fourth quarter and lost the NFL championship to the Philadelphia Eagles. The Green Bay Packers had been thinking about this brutal loss for the entire offseason, and now... Finally, training camp had arrived, and it was time to get to work. The players were eager to advance their game to the next level and start working on the details that would help them win a championship. Their coach, Vince Lombardi, had a different idea. He took nothing for granted. He, became a, he began a tradition of starting from scratch. He began with the most elemental statement of all, which is now a famous statement in, uh, down in the, in the archives of NFL history. And he said this, he picked up a pigskin football and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. Mm. That's what he started with. Lombardi was coaching a group of three dozen professional athletes who just a month prior had come within minutes of winning the biggest prize their sport could offer an NFL championship. And yet here he is holding up a football to these experts in the field and saying, gentlemen, this is a football. Let's start there. Think about this for a minute. His methodical coverage of the fundamentals continued throughout training camp. Each player reviewed how to block, how to tackle, they opened up the playbook. They started from page one. At some point, Max McGee, the Packers' Pro Bowl wide receiver, joked, uh, Coach, could you slow down a little? You're going a little too fast for us. <laughs> Lombardi continued this obsession with the fundamentals, the basics. His team would become the best in the league at the tasks everyone else took for granted. Yeah. Six months later, the Green Bay Packers beat the New York Giants 37 to nothing to win the NFL championship. See, it would do Christians well to start with the basics. It would do you and I well to let Jesus break us in half, to quit acting on how much you think you know, and let Jesus drive that vehicle once and for all, to let Jesus be the driver of your life, to let Jesus actually have a hold of you. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So they can break you. It would do well for you and I to remember who we are, to look in the mirror, Remind ourselves how we're not really all that. In fact, we can't remember a time, honestly, that we were ever all that. Come on. If we'll be honest for a moment. We, we need to remember what we believe. And where we're going from here. And if we're ever going to do anything great for God, we need to, un we need to understand these things. We need to let Jesus take a hold of us. And break us. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh... The desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. Yes. See, the traditional thought behind breaking bread is to make it usable. See, bread came in loaves, especially back then. You can't eat a loaf, so it was broken into smaller pieces to be consumed. That's why we have to say the best invention since sliced bread, because slicing bread was a huge invention. Slicing bread was a big deal because it was a lot better than breaking bread. But, but the reason it became such a big deal is because for centuries, bread was broken in order to become useful. And that's a picture of you and I. 
For a life to be useful for the master, it's going to be broken so it can be used. First, it has to be torn apart. First, it has to start over. Our attitudes, our prejudices, our biases, our hurts, our, our violations, our bitternesses, our outlooks in life, our lack of faith, our culture of bad decision making, claiming uh, uh, destiny at the moment of pot uh, uh, potential increase. Uh, amen. All forgiveness of self, forgiveness of others, breaking our pride by being teachable and for service to others. These are things that Jesus needs to do to break us down. He needs to make us uh, humble and then bring humility into our lives. Give us compassion and, and patience so that we can be nice to people and we can wait for somebody that can't do everything as fast as you. I'm speaking to myself. We need to wait. Have patience with people. Reach out. Don't wait to be told this person needs this or that. You can see what they need. God showed you what they need. Now, mean it. So the problem is, unless we are allowing our lives into the hands of the Master, and we can never be broken. And this revelation will not come. Because if you are not broken by God, then you'll never receive the revelation, redemptive, elevation, spirit, amen, that will lift you out of the natural into the supernatural. For a life to be useful for the master, it's going to have to be broken if it's going to be used. Thirdly, he multiplied what was in his hands. He blessed what was in his hands? He broke what was in his hands and he multiplied what was in his hands. The annual amount of charitable giving per year for the last few years has been around 300 billion B. 75% from individuals, 25% from corporations or foundations. Bill Gates has given away approximately 80% of his net worth in the last 15 years. His foundation funds research into different diseases, food production for the poor, creating jobs for low uh, economies and health systems for third world nations. He's doing a lot on malaria in Africa, which is something close to my heart. And this is a noble example of how someone with a little ingenuity and vision can turn a profitable product into a force for good to the poor and needy. See, but we are not Bill Gates. How many can say amen? Mm -hmm. We don't have billions to stack. But we do have an ability to be used for a force for good in this world. We have the ability to make impact. We can become something supernatural to a lost and a dying world. After the master blessed, then broke the loaves, he gave them. He gave them to the world. He gave them to the hungry. He gave them to the needy. He, he blessed them. He broke them. And then he sent them out. He gave them to bless those that were hungry to bless. Those that were, uh, he would not let them leave until first he gave of what he had blessed and broken for their benefit, for their ministry, for their hope in the form of bread. Amen. That's a powerful thought. What was originally given in the hands of the master was small and insignificant. We may feel small and insignificant. I don't know about you. We may feel daunted by the tasks before us. We may think, how can I have influence? How can I make impact? How is this possible for me in my life with my few talents, with nothing really going for me, with no real money to speak of? How is it possible that I can do anything for God? You might be thinking that on a regular basis. See, God only breaks us so that we can be broadened, so that we can be multiplied, so that our lives can be extended, amen, to reach others, so our lives can be multiplied, transcendent talents, abilities and resources, amen, could be, could be broadened, could be pushed, could be multiplied, could be taken further, amen, unless he broke us, he could not multiply us, unless the bread was broken, it could not feed the poor, it could not feed those that were hungry, and it got broken, and the Bible says there were 12 baskets left over of what, of pieces of broken bread, why, because what we do to minister to those to minister those that have need, it multiplies that 
as well. We don't stay Amen. one piece of bread. Amen. Amen. We go out and become 10 pieces of bread, which becomes 10 more, which becomes 20 more. And the next thing you know, amen, 12 times what they ever had to begin with is left over in pieces of what was once broken lives that was now used to touch 12,000 people. Five loaves, two fish. You're probably thinking, yeah, I'm the guy that's a kid's lunch. That's my life. My life is, I'm looking at 12,000 people that have me, and all I've got in life is five loaves, two fish. You're looking at that compared to that need. And you're thinking, there's no way I can make any difference. Yet in the master's hand, That's right. 12 baskets of you were left over after you fed every single person in the place. Come on, somebody. See, God only breaks us so we can be broadened. John 15, 2, every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Why? So that he can bear more fruit. When he is breaking you, he is doing it so that he can use us in a greater manner. The bread and fish were simply a young boy's lunch before they were placed in the master's hand. It was completely in insignificant in the sight of such a large crowd. It was hard to imagine what that boy thought when he was told that his lunch would be used to feed every single person in the field. Yeah, we right. <laughs> to feed everybody there, that's insane. I would know of doubt if I were the young boy, would have no doubt mm. responded wrongly. <laughs> Whatever. Shut up. <laughs> I'd, I'd have been the guy that told Peter, hey, I need your lunch, we're going to feed everybody. I said, shut up. No, no, Paul did do nothing. Don't worry for me. Don't touch my lunch. Look at me. <laughs> I would have no doubt responded wrongly. But everything he touches, everything Jesus touches, everything from our lives that we put into his hands can be used in this life man. I know this might sound familiar. How is this going to work? The pastor, you're preaching a really nice sermon, but have you seen my life lately? <laughs> Have you looked at what I got stacked up against me? Have you seen the wall I'm up against? Have you looked at my paycheck? Have you seen my bills? Do you know how late I am on almost everything? I mean, you're, you're saying this to yourself. Do you have any idea that I am so underwater that I don't even know why I haven't already drowned? My life is an absolute mess. You're talking about me being multiplied and blessing fast. Are you kidding me? It's a successful day if I can get my kid to school, right? How is this going to work? I can't even see any hope. See, we all struggle with similar thoughts when we see a daunting task set before us. Not just the evangelism of this city, not just the evangelism of the nations or the world, but we can struggle with how we're going to pay our bills. How am I going to pull out of this depression, this funk? How do I really serve God to my fullest capacity when I don't sometimes even feel like coming to church? How in the world can I become this thing you're talking about when I don't even know how? I've got zero talents. I mean, there was somebody that said to me, and I can't remember who it was, they said, I completely failed all of your announcements. I said, what? They said, yeah, you were asking for people uh, on the platform that could play instruments. I can't play nothing. Then you were asking for money. I don't have any money. <laughs> so I completely failed. That was before the sermon pastor. I'm already failing. I already failed. I failed in church, and we haven't even had the sermon yet. I... Do, you, do you understand, Pastor, my life just failed your announcements? I literally just failed the announcement period. How in the world am I going to survive this sermon? So, Pastor, from now on, Pastor, from now on, I would like you to pull an altar call after.
announcements, please. Because I'm not going to make it through that sermon. <laughs> How can I serve God to my fullest capacity? How can I win my family, my friends, and my neighbors? It may seem like a simple answer, but it's a profound truth. Yes. And the key is to place your life, your decisions, your future, your hope, your dreams, the direction that you're going, the places that your life is not yet taken. You put that all in your basket and put it in the hands of Jesus and let him lift it up to heaven and bless it. Right. Then let him get a hold of some things in your life that are just flat out yucky. And let him break those up. Let him break those up. And let him turn those into something that can multiply in your amazement. The key is to place your life and all of those things in the master's hands and trust in his ability. He can bless it. He can break it. He can multiply it, all for his transcendent purposes, all to broaden our scope, to enlarge our tents, to multiply our usefulness. You want to rise up this year? You want to rise up in 2017? Then put your life into the mat.